Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about VX. VX is one of those weapons of mass destruction you hear about. Some people refer to it as a nerve gas, but it's not really a gas. Of course, it's a weapon of mass destruction. It's an extremely toxic form of an organophosphate. That's just simple pesticide. Chemical is tasteless, odorless, and clear except when you have some impurities in the manufacturing process. It may have an amber-like color. It's severely disruptive to the nervous system, and it prevents the muscles from working normally. According to the Centers for Disease Control, it's among the most toxic and rapidly acting nerve agent known to man. According to the National Academy of Sciences, a 150-pound man will die if exposed to the amount in a grain of rice the size of a grain of rice, highly toxic material. It has the texture and feel of motor oil. It's a highly viscous chemical. It tends to persist for a long period of time in the environment. It can be distributed as a liquid. It can be mixed with talc or clay, or it can be distributed as an aerosol. VX is the best known of the V series of nerve agents. It's also called an area denial weapon. If it's spread on a shipyard or a battlefield or a port, then nobody can use that facility or those facilities for a relatively long period of time because that chemical will stay there and poison anybody who enters. It's far more toxic than sarin but it works in a relatively similar fashion. Unlike sarin, the VX persists for a long period of time. It doesn't degrade. You can't simply just wash it away. It remains on the surfaces for weeks to months. Why does it work? Well, these chemical agents work because when the nerve is triggered, it releases a chemical that's known as acetylcholine. Acetylcholine stimulates the muscle. Then that acetylcholine has to be broken down. Otherwise, if there's too much acetylcholine around, the muscle will go into spasm. Well, the way the nerve agents work, they prevent the breakdown of the acetylcholine by an enzyme known as acetylcholinesterase. So they inactivate the acetylcholinesterase, and as a result, there's an enormous amount of this acetylcholine that stimulates the muscles and stimulates the glands. And unfortunately, when that happens, then we get significant toxicity. Now, this acetylcholinesterase, the enzyme that's inactivated by the VX, well, every single second, it would normally cause the destruction of 5,000 molecules of the acetylcholine. So you can imagine how much of the chemical is going to be in the nerve to stimulate the muscle. So in the absence of the acetylcholinesterase, which is what the VX or the sarin does, then we're going to have continuous stimulation of the muscles and the glands and portions of the brain. And as with most other chemical reactions known to medicine, it seems like it's not just on this particular area that I'm talking about, but it also seems to work on maybe some noradrenaline, norepinephrine, or dopamine, or the GABA system. It's simple to manufacture this kind of a chemical, but the chemicals necessary to manufacture it are tightly regulated when it's manufactured. It only comes out to be about 95% pure. Now, if it's 95% pure, it's going to degrade at the rate of about 5% a month. But if it's stabilized, if certain chemicals are added to prevent the deterioration, if you get some of the water out, then this chemical can last for 30 or 40 years. Or it can be manufactured up to the point when the final mixture is made. We refer to this as the binary agent. So we can have two flasks and neither of those chemicals are going to degrade significantly. And when we mix them together, that forms the VX. And that's the highly toxic property. That's the highly toxic chemical. And it can be stored for long periods of time and mixed just at the last minute. So as a weapon of mass destruction, it either gets on the skin or it's inhaled. It gets into the eye. And sometimes it gets in the water and then into the gastrointestinal system, it's food. 
the poisoning occurs with the absorption, but it depends on the dose, depends on your genetic proclivity. What are the symptoms? Well, if it gets on your skin, in the localized area where it occurs, there is significant perspiration locally and some twitching of the muscles. Then you get some nausea and vomiting. If you inhale the substance, then it starts with a runny nose and tightness in the chest and shortness of breath and the pupils become constricted. Actually, you get blurred vision, especially at night because the pupils are so tiny. And then you can develop pain from the contraction of those muscles, especially when you try to look at something quite close. And then there's nausea and dizziness. And then following this, there's profound salivation and drooling and perspiration and your nose runs and then you get mucus in your respiratory tract so that it's very difficult to breathe and you get foam coming out of your mouth and then with excess of secretions in the gastrointestinal system there's abdominal pain there's nausea vomiting and then of course diarrhea there's involuntary urination involuntary defecation people feel tired and they develop headaches, slurred speech, difficulty concentrating, confusions and hallucinations and tightness of the chest, and the heart rate and the blood pressure go up or sometimes go down. People develop convulsions, loss of consciousness, paralysis, and then they die because of respiratory depression. Sometimes it's referred to as the sludge syndrome. Sludge is an acronym. It stands for salivation and lacrimation, that's watery eyes, urination, sweating or diaphoresis, gastrointestinal motility, and emesis, and sometimes we refer to it as the dumbbell syndrome. And the dumbbell, again, an acronym, adds a slow heart rate and constriction of the bronchial tubes and sometimes fasciculation of the muscles. Do we have an antidote? Sure we do. We have atropine. Atropine can prevent the acetylcholine from working. It's a potentially toxic compound by itself. We have a safer chemical known as biperidin. It's used for the shakiness of Parkinson's disease. The endpoint is a clearing of the bronchial secretions. But unfortunately, the atropine doesn't seem to work terribly well on the muscles. But another chemical known as pralidoxime, that takes the phosphate that sits on top of the acetylcholinesterase and inactivates it, and it gets it off. So we need the two chemicals. Unfortunately, if we don't get the pralidoxine soon enough, then it's not going to be able to get the phosphate off. It's not going to be able to reactivate the acetylcholinesterase. Military, when they're potentially exposed, they are given an injector, an auto-injector, that contains both the atropine and the pralidoxime. When a person is exposed, obviously the first thing to do is get the liquid off the skin instantly, decontaminate it by using household bleach and then flushing the area with water. Get the clothes off, but don't pull them off over your head. Cut them off if necessary. Put them in a bag and then double bag it. First series of chemicals in the nerve agent class were the G series. The G series, G for German, they were developed by the German pharmaceutical industry, chemical industry. They were actually trying to manufacture an insecticide during World War II when they had a problem with weevils. They were working on the new series. Actually, they discovered something known as Tabin. That killed insects very quickly, but unfortunately, it was highly toxic. The V series began in 1952 in Britain. The imperial chemical industry, they had two people working on some of these phosphates, again, as insecticides, Dr. Ranajit Ghosh and Dr. J.E. Newman. Well, they were trying to get a new class of these organophosphates, the insecticides. And actually, for a brief period of time, one was marketed, marketed as Amitin, but it was taken off the market almost immediately because it was too toxic. Samples were sent to the British Armed Forces Chemical Research Facility at Porton Down, and actually the British government synthesized the VX for the first time in 1952. 
Actually, they traded it to the United States government. We gave them information on how to make thermonuclear devices. They gave us information on how to make the nerve agents. In the United States, we began full production in 1961. Well, the first series, as I said, were the G agents. Second series, the V agents. And what does the V stand for? A lot of people have used different references. Some people call it venomous, some people call it victory, some people just call it viscous. Also referred to, by the way, as Tamerlan Esther. Tamerlan was a doctor working in the Swedish National Defense Institute, and he published the information also at the same time as Dr. Gosh in 1952, but he didn't get as much publicity. Well, has it ever been used? Yes, but, but mostly accidentally. So they had a problem at the Dugway Proving Ground in Utah. It's about an 800,000 acre facility. And they were testing some VX. And unfortunately, one of the nozzles on the canister in an airplane malfunctioned. And actually what happened was they killed 6,000 sheep in a ranch nearby. That happened in 1968 but the Air Force didn't admit to it until about 1998. And then in 1969, year after the first catastrophe, then we had an area where 23 military people and one civilian were hospitalized after they were exposed to some of the VX when it leaked from a US military base in Okinawa. And then People know of the Om Shinrikyo group in Japan. They're famous for the Tokyo subway sarin ex uh, bombing or sarin exposure. Well, most people don't know that they also developed VX and they used VX and they injured two people and killed one person. The first victim was thought to be a police informant. And in 1994, he was out for a jog and two members of the Aum San Rikyo cult approached him and squirted some of the VX as a liquid on his neck. He chased him for a short while and then he collapsed. He was in a coma for 10 days and then he died. They subsequently confessed to using VX. They actually had two trained chemists. They had joined the group the summer before. They tried to make a significant amount of VX they wanted to make a couple pounds, but they only made about 70 grams. They used it on another person. person was out walking, and again, they squirted some on his neck. Fortunately, most of it got on his clothes. He was a vocal opponent of the group. Actually, his son had been a member, and he helped other people leave. Well, he was in a coma for about two weeks, but he recovered. We know that Iraq tried to use the VX, but they weren't very successful. When they manufactured it, it was only about 18 to 40 percent pure, and it wasn't sufficient to weaponize. Actually, the United States government bombed a Sudanese pharmaceutical plant in 1998. They were thought to have been producing VX. They were thought to be the group that produced it for both Iraq and Al-Qaeda. More recently, it's been in the news. In February of 2017, of course, there was the half-brother of Kim Jong-un, the ruler of North, North Korea. The man's name was Kim Jong-nam. He was assassinated at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport in Malaysia. He was murdered by VX. Some people, two women, actually spread it. Remember we talked about the binary, the active ingredient, and then the activator? Well, that's apparently what was done because otherwise it would have been too toxic and both of those women would have died. After Kim Jong-nam was exposed, after they rubbed it on his face, he didn't seem to have any unusual symptoms. He went to a medical facility, was taken to an ambulance, died on the way to the hospital, these two women, an Indonesian woman and a Vietnamese woman, applied liquid to his face. They said it was a prank. They had been paid $90 US. One of the women developed some vomiting afterward, but neither of them had significant problem. 
according to most experts, if it was really legitimate VX, the active form, well, both of the women would have died, whether they had gloves or whether they didn't have gloves. We know that North Korea synthesized the VX long time ago, has a limited shelf life, as we talked about. If it's a unitary agent, long, or if it's the binary agent, these chemicals, known and unknown, were banned by the Geneva Protocol in 1925. They said you can't use them in war. But it took them until 1993 to say that you can't develop them, you can't produce them, you can't stockpile them, you can't transfer them, and you can't retain them. You have to get rid of them. That was the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention that took effect in 1997, and all countries everywhere were supposed to get rid of their weapons of mass destruction, their VX, their sarin, all of these chemicals, by the year 2007, at the present time, we still have some of the chemicals left here in the United States, estimated that they won't be completely destroyed up until somewhere in the early 2020s. Well, we've destroyed many tons of the material. It was used, or it was weaponized. We had it manufactured and put on rockets and artillery shells and we used it as sprays and in airplanes. Also did this with sarin. We started destroying the material after the convention. Started actually doing that in 1969. We got pretty far along by 1970, but still doing it up till the present time. There was a program in the Navy, and it was called CHASE. CHASE stands for cut holes in them and sink them. What we did is we filled up some warships with all of the material. And there was a significant amount of material. There were 22,000 rockets. There were 19 bulk containers containing about 1,500 pounds per container of these materials. The ships were towed off of Atlantic City and sunk in about 7,200 feet of water. Stockpiles still exist, thought to still exist in the United States and in Russia. Unfortunately, in Syria and North Korea, now the Russian VX is not as potent, in fact, it's only about half as potent as the material we have here in the United States. There seems to be a little chemical difference between them. Now, North Korea, as I said, still has some of the material. Don't know how much, but it's estimated that they have somewhere between 2,500 tons and 5,000 tons. Well, compared to sarin, we know that this chemical is much more toxic, certainly much more toxic when there's skin exposure and significantly more toxic when we have respiratory exposure. The bottom line is that we have a lot of awful weapons out there, a lot of awful chemicals out there, a lot of poison chemicals out there, that some rogue groups, rogue nations may well decide at some point to use, probably as terror weapons more than weapons of mass destruction. These are bad chemicals and unfortunately if there is a problem most people will not be able to cope. We don't have the antidotes readily available to the general public. Well if you want to know more about these nerve agents we also did a video on sarin. Anyway Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.